All right, so we're recording. <laughs> so again, thank you, Thomas and Frank, for being here. I'm just going to give a quick background about the two of them, um, like I said, and then they'll be presenting. So Thomas Lindsay serves as senior legal counsel for the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights, an organization committed to globally advancing the legal rights of nature and environmental rights. He is the co-founder of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund and is widely recognized as the founder of the contemporary community rights and rights of nature movements, which have resulted in the adoption of several hundred laws across the United States and around the world. He sits on the board of advisors of the New Earth Foundation. He is a summa, or, sorry, he is a cum laude graduate of Widener Law School and a three-time recipient of the law school's Public Interest Law Award. He has been a finalist for the Ford Foundation's Leadership for a Changing World Award and is a recipient of the Pennsylvania Farmers Union's Golden Triangle Legislative Award. He is also the co-founder of the Daniel Pennock Democracy School, now taught in 24 states across the country, which has graduated over 5,000 lawyers, activists, and municipal officials, which assists groups to create new community campaigns with which elevate the rights of those communities over rights claimed by corporations. He's also the author of multiple books, including Be the Change, How to Get What You Want in Your Community, On Community Civil Disobedience in the Name of Sustainability, and The Modern American Democracy and Other Fairy Tales. And he's also the co-author of We the People, Stories for the Community Rights Movement in the United States. He has served as a co-host of Democracy Matters, a public affairs radio show broadcast from KYRS in Spokane, Washington, and syndicated on 10 other stations. He was featured in Leonardo DiCaprio in Tree Media's film 11th Hour and We the People 2.0, assisted the Ecuadorian Constitutional Assembly in 2008 to adopt the world's first con constitution recognizing the independently enforceable rights of ecosystems and is a frequent lecturer at conferences across the country. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Mother Jones, The Nation Magazine. He was named in 2007 as one of Forbes Magazine's top 10 revolutionaries. And in 2018, Lindsay was named as one of the top 400 environmentalists of the last 200 years and the two volume encyclopedia, American Environmental Leaders. Lindsay currently resides in Spokane, Washington. And our next presenter, Frank Bibo is an enrolled member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe who has been living on Leech Lake Reservation in Ball Club, Minnesota, most of his life. That's Frank really. is a tribal attorney working extensively with Chippewa treaty rights, civil rights, and sovereignty on and off reservation. Frank processes wild rice and smokes whitefish in Ball Club. Frank has been working with Honor the Earth, a native-led nonprofit environmental protection group led by Winona LaDuke, Frank has developed several legal defense strategies based on the rights of Manumin. Um, Frank serves as executive director for the 1855 Treaty Authority and represented uh, the Wild Rice Manumin and the White Earth Band of Ojibwe and Manumin versus DNR and the White Earth Tribal Court and DNR versus WEBO and Chief Judge DeGroot in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Frank will discuss wild rice from the time of creation and migration stories where the Anishinaabe, hopefully I said that right, <laughs> we're looking for the place where the food grows on the water, food sovereignty and sustainability and the protection of natural resources to, in the present. So again, thank you both for coming and I will um, pass it over to you. Thank you, Jasmine. I'm kind of the opening act tonight, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to Frank for the main event. But uh, the, the for the opening tonight, we thought we would uh, give a description of the rights of nature, basically a, you know, what is it kind of mini course for folks that are just hearing about it for the first time, what is rights of nature kind of stuff, and then going through where it's been adopted, where it's been enforced, how it's becoming real on the ground. So it's not just some 30,000 foot academic concept of nature having rights, uh, but where the where the work is happening. And uh, Frank, uh, who will come after this relatively short PowerPoint, will talk about, you know, the, the first enforcement case of rights of nature in a tribal court. 
uh, and the passage by the White Earth Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota of this uh, Rights of Wild Rice Law. And so I'm going to go ahead and share screen with the PowerPoint. All right, so this is where we begin tonight, which is topic of conversation, rights of nature and indigenous activism. Uh, this is our group, the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. And again, uh, presenters tonight, uh, myself, uh, I work for an organization called the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. And Frank, uh, who's a tribal attorney with the 1855 Treaty Authority and the White Earth Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota. And also just a note, I won't be able to see chat comments. So if you have a question, just yell it out. Uh, feel free to interrupt as we're moving through these. I'm gonna go very quickly through these slides. Uh, so if folks uh, wanna save questions again, that's fine too. But if you have a question that you're just bursting with, just go ahead and ask it uh, and I'll stop and then we can we can try to answer that question. So, so for tonight, what we're talking about is this concept of rights of nature. Uh, as a legal theory, uh, and just in very basic terms, what is it and where does it come from? And so to answer the first question, what is it, rights of nature, it's the recognition by legislation, so the passage of a law, or by jurisprudence, which is a court decision, of the legally enforceable rights of nature and ecosystems. So we're talking about creating or recognizing legally enforceable rights of nature and ecosystems. This means recognizing human civil rights type protections for nature as a whole or for ecosystems that comprise nature. Now, sometimes that gives our brain a little wiggle because we're used to talking about civil rights as belonging to humans. So AKA state constitution bill of rights, federal constitution bill of rights, but this is about actually treating rights for nature, taking that concept of rights, which is the highest elevated protections within our Western system of law that we recognize for anything. So very high level of protection and affording nature and ecosystems as being rights bearers. So again, it kind of messes with our brain a little bit to talk about civil rights for ecosystems, but that's kind of the concept here. These human civil rights type protections for nature as a whole, and of course, nature can't have equal protection or due process uh, kind of rights protections as we find within the federal constitution, but nature can have other rights like to exist and to flourish and to thrive and rivers to flow, uh, have appropriate habitat for native flora and fauna, those types of things. So rights of nature is generally seen as an attempt to augment or strengthen existing environmental laws by heightening the types of protections that are afforded to nature. Now, of course, rights of nature, we talk about under Western European law as basically having a beginning in the 1970s when uh, the US Supreme Court, a justice uh, authored a dissenting opinion in a very well-known case. Uh, and that dissenting opinion kind of got the lawyers thinking about these concepts. But of course, rights of nature has deep, deep indigenous roots and origins, uh, traceable back to this concept, this indigenous understanding of nature as not being property. Uh, nature is not being property to be owned, that nature couldn't be owned. Uh, and First Nations, of course, speak about nature as a living being or as a relative. And I don't think the contrast can be any greater between these two different kind of value systems. So we're talking about the Western European system of law underneath which most of us live, uh, compared with indigenous cultures through this lens of treatment of nature. So indigenous communities talk about nature as a living being or as a relative. The Yurok Nation talks about the Klamath River as a, as a relative. The Anishinaabe people talk about the flying people, swimming people, singing people, uh, being the birds and the fish. Uh, so a, a different kind of relationship than what we have under the Western world, the Western European treatment of nature, which is that nature is property uh, to be used by its owner. So if, if you have a deed to a parcel of land, uh, that deed carries with it a bundle of rights under the Western European system of law. And, and one of those bundles of one of those rights within the bundle of rights is the right to destroy the property. So you have exclusive control over it. You can uh, destroy it as part of that bundle of rights. 
uh, it's basically nature is a dead thing whose exploitation is to be regulated by the law. Uh, and I, my, I say favorite, least favorite quote, probably Sir Francis Bacon. I bet nobody thought they'd be talking about Sir Francis Bacon tonight. Uh, but Sir Francis Bacon, a famous English philosopher, once said that uh, kind of the goal of Western civilization was to torture nature on a rack to extract her secrets. So I don't know about you, but I have a hard time holding in one hand flying people, swimming people, singing people, and torturing nature on a rack. Uh, holding those in the same palm is very difficult. So very different treatment between those two different systems. So tracing this rights of nature concept in U.S. law, where did it where did it emerge in U.S. law? And the answer is uh, we can peg it to a specific year, which is uh, which is strange because usually these big items you can't take back to a specific year. But the year was 1972, and in 1972, a law professor named Christopher Stone uh, at uh, the University of Southern California uh, Law School uh, wrote a law review article. Uh, and the title of it was, uh, Should Trees Have Standing Towards Legal Rights for Natural Objects? And he, he wrote this piece, which basically proposed that natural objects in the environment should be given legal rights. So towards the end of that paragraph, he talks about giving legal rights to forests, ocean, rivers, and other so-called natural objects in the environment. And he also made this point, which is that, you know, conferring rights onto some new entity usually sounds laughable. And in fact, 15 years ago, I think the rights of nature kind of sounded laughable uh, or, as he puts it, odd or frightening. Uh, but then he goes on to say this is partly because until the rightless thing receives its rights, we can't see it as anything else but a thing for the use of us, those who are holding rights at the time. So whether that's women in the 1840s, whether it's slaves in the 1830s, uh, those uh, persons, those entities, uh, we're not rights holders under our system of law. And today, nature in most places, not a rights holder either, uh, but that's the concept of the movement. So in 1972, this law review article coincided with a U.S. Supreme Court case called Sierra Club versus Morton. Not uh, important to get your teeth into too many details here, but it was a proposal for a ski resort. Uh, in a uh, specific part of California. It was going to be bigger than Disneyland. Uh, the Sierra Club, National Club, sued to stop the development. Lower courts dismissed the Sierra Club out for lack of standing, found that uh, none of your members uh, were injured by the proposed development to the extent necessary to be a plaintiff. This all comes down to something called standing, that in most environmental law cases today, you have to prove that you have standing to even cross the courthouse doors. Uh, to actually get into court, you have to show standing. Standing usually comes down to some kind of financial or property impairment uh, that you have to prove that you suffered in order to be a plaintiff. And in this case, the courts found that the Sierra Club didn't have it, uh, the lower courts. And the Sierra Club appealed up to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court also found that the Sierra Club didn't have standing and threw the Sierra Club out of the case uh, and dismissed the case. Uh, the only reason we remember this case now is from a dissenting opinion from Justice William O. Douglas, who was probably one of the most progressive justices ever to serve on the Supreme Court. And he took Christopher Stone's article and actually wrote it into the opinion, the dissenting opinion saying that the suit uh, would therefore be more properly labeled as Mineral King versus Morton, Mineral King being the valley into which the development was proposed, so that the plaintiff would be the ecosystem itself, the ecosystem that was going to be impacted itself, which changes completely the standing inquiry. It's no longer about is this person affected or are these people affected by the project in some way? Uh, it, the standing inquiry then asks the question, is the ecosystem affected in some way, which are two completely different inquiries. Uh, and the point that Justice uh, William O. Douglas was making was that uh, the law should allow for these entities to be plaintiffs uh, so that these cases could be heard on the merits uh, and not uh, be kind of you know interfered with or go off course by examining the standing inquiry about whether people have a use in exploiting the ecosystem, does that give them the right to be appointed in uh, court? And so 
what happened, a lot of people ask what happened after Morton in 1972. And the answer is not much. Uh, what did happen in a very small way is that some creative lawyers began trying to use the case uh, and this law review article to bring cases in the name of animal and plant species as plaintiffs. And this is just a listing of some of the cases that were brought. There was a case brought in the name of grizzly bears, uh, an endangered plant, uh, the spotted owl in the West, uh, red, the red squirrel. There was an interesting case on the New England Aquarium about uh, brought in the name of cetaceans that were kept in the New England Aquarium. Uh, you had birds, you had loggerhead turtles, you had some key deer. Uh, in another case, you had whales and dolphins in the Bush case back in 2004. All these cases were pretty much brought under the umbrella of the Endangered Species Act. And the only difference was, instead of using the Endangered Species Act with human plaintiffs, that lawyers generally, or not generally, but some creative lawyers are trying to use animals and plants as plaintiffs in those particular cases. But they, these cases weren't brought under a rights of nature framework. There was no new law. It was just the Endangered Species Act and switching out the plaintiffs. And whereas this approach met with some receptivity back in the 1980s uh, by specifically the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is in the Northwest, uh, where in 1988, you can see what they wrote in an opinion in which they held that the Hawaiian palila bird uh, quote, has legal status and wings its way into federal court as a plaintiff in its own right. Uh, and so basically validating this concept that animals and plants can serve as plaintiffs. But then in 2004, in the Bush case dealing with cetacean, the Navy sonar case dealing with impact of sonar on uh, cetacean, dolphins, and whales community, uh, then they backed up and said, uh, we agree with the district court that our statements earlier were just non-binding. Uh, and turned it over to Congress to say if Congress meant that animals and plants should be able to sue under the Endangered Species Act, then they should have said so plainly and could say so plainly in the future, but we're going to kind of backtrack from where we were originally in the 1980s. So we're going to take a quick look at municipal laws in the United States that have been passed around uh, rights of nature to legally recognize rights of nature. Uh, the first place was a little place called Tamaqua Borough, a very small community of 7,000 people in rural Pennsylvania. I'm showing my age at this point, but I was the one that actually drafted this law back in 2006 for the city, for the borough council, which is like city council, except called boroughs in Pennsylvania. Um, again, details are not that important, but the community was faced with a project to dump uh, toxic waste uh, from the Delaware River into this small borough. Borough is the home to Philadelphia's drinking, part of Philadelphia's drinking water supply and other creeks and rivers. Uh, they asked us about adopting a local law. So this is the most important part of our work over the past 50 years, a municipal law passed by the borough that would recognize the rights of ecosystems to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve within an ordinance that also banned the toxic waste dumping as a violation of those rights of ecosystems in Tamaqua Borough. Uh, I think to everybody's surprise, probably the Borough Council passed the law. It's still, still in the municipal code for the borough. Project was canceled because of that opposition and a variety of other reasons, but Tamaqua Borough became the first rights of nature law adopted in the world. So first rights of nature, in this case, municipal law adopted in the world, which recognize certain legally enforceable rights. Again, this is not about resolutions, uh, as popular as those may be. This is not about, hey, wouldn't it be great if we did X? This is actually recognizing, in this case, these waterways as having certain legally enforceable rights. Some of you may have heard about the Lake Erie Bill of Rights in 2019. Uh, you know, Lake Erie's been through a, a bunch of uh, different problems as well as neighboring communities. So cyanobacteria algae bloom uh, shut down Toledo's water supply in 2014. Uh, you had a successive number of years in which nobody was doing anything at the state level or federal level to actually stop these issues or, or resolve the problems. Um, and it was then that a group in Toledo approached us about writing a Lake Erie Bill of Rights, uh, which would have recognized and did recognize Lake Erie as having rights to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve. It was passed by 62% of the residents of Toledo in February of 2019. Uh, it's become kind of one of the bigger uh, rights of nature uh, experiments 
that has been done at a, in a major municipality. Uh, so the Lake Erie Bill of Rights in 2019. The biggest municipality to pass a rights of nature law in the US is Orange County, Florida. In 2020, we assisted a group of environmental leaders uh, there, including some Sierra Club members, to write a amendment to the Orange County Charter. Orange County is where Orlando is. It's a county of 1.5 million people, so big, big county. Uh, and the proposed amendment that they qualified for the ballot and put on the ballot recognized that several rivers, the Wakaiva and Econlachashie River and other waters of Orange County, had the legally enforceable rights to exist, flow, be free of pollution, and maintain a healthy ecosystem. So again, in this case, a voter referenda passed this part of passed a new municipal law uh, to uh, in Orange County, Florida, which recognized the legally enforceable rights of these waterways uh, to these rights: exist, flow, be free of pollution, maintain a healthy ecosystem. Amazingly, I think to a lot of people, especially because it's Florida. Uh, the amendment passed with 89% of voters in favor of the initiative. And folks who work on initiatives know that that never happens. Uh, tribal laws in the US, it should not be surprising that because of the indigenous origins, long indigenous roots of rights of nature concepts uh, that tribal nations across the United States have adopted resolutions and laws uh, recognizing rights of nature. So the Ho-Chunk tribe in Wisconsin, uh, the Ponca tribe in Oklahoma, the White Earth Ojibwe uh, in Minnesota, which of course Frank is going to talk more about, the Menominee uh, tribe, the Yurok Nation, the Nez Perce Nation, my neck of the woods uh, in Idaho, right down the road in Idaho from Washington State. And of course, uh, Frank's going to talk more about this uh, after I'm done as the opening act. Uh, but the White Earth Ojibwe have been, White Earth Band of Ojibwe have been one of the most active in terms of not only adopting rights of nature laws to protect uh, Monoman or wild rice, uh, so Monoman as Anishinaabe for wild rice, Ojibwe for wild rice, uh, and that the law that they pass recognizes the rights of wild rice to exist, flourish, regenerate, and evolve as well as several other rights, uh, passing that in 2018. Frank's gonna talk more about that later in terms of how the rights of nature has been melded with these tribal treaty rights uh, that the tribe holds uh, with the U.S. government uh, in terms of enforcing these kinds of rights of nature through that tribal treaty framework. Uh, in addition to tribes, over three dozen, or combined, over three dozen municipal and tribal governments have adopted rights of nature across the United States. Uh, that's as of last year. There's a couple more uh, now as of this year. Uh, but this is kind of a 30,000 foot uh, view of what some of these rights of nature laws look like. The uh, city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is one of the larger municipalities that has passed a rights of nature law. It uh, happened back in 2010, and it was basically a battle over hydrofracking for natural gas within the city of Pittsburgh and protecting the three rivers that run through the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, the provisions of the law that they passed both banned hydrofracking for natural gas within the city boundaries, uh, but also recognized rights of ecosystems within the city of Pittsburgh, specifically with an eye towards uh, protecting the three rivers. And this is just a broad overview of the three elements that we find in most rights of nature laws. Uh, they're the recognition of rights, who can enforce those rights, and what kind of remedies can you get when you enforce those rights. So this is the, this is the exact language from Chapter 618 of the City of Pittsburgh's Municipal Code. And what you see with, with the, the first thing that you see in these laws is a recognition of rights. And not just rights of nature, but also rights of people, which are generally melded together. Uh, and so you have a right to water, uh, which the city of Pittsburgh passed, to recognize that residents have a right to sustainably access, use, consume, and preserve water drawn from natural water cycles. And then you have the rights of nature. So the first one is a right to, prepositions are important, it's a right to something. And rights of nature is about rights of uh, ecosystems and natural communities. And again, Pittsburgh chose to specifically protect streams, rivers, aquifers, and other water systems. Uh, so this is, again, City of Pittsburgh, Chapter 618. The second part is, uh, of the three parts of these laws, is standing. And most of these laws give any resident of the municipality the legal authority to enforce those rights on behalf of those natural communities. 
So think about it as stepping into the shoes of the river and the river being a plaintiff in bringing the action. So hearkening back kind of to William O. Douglas's uh, dissenting opinion about ecosystems as plaintiffs. Uh, and so legally authorizing residents to actually step into the shoes of the ecosystem to bring legal actions uh, against violators, both private and public, on behalf of those ecosystems. And then remedies, what, what kind of things can you get? Well, mostly written into these laws is damages that is measured by the cost of restoring the natural community or ecosystem to its pre-damaged state. So we talk about this a lot, but under conventional environmental laws, there's no guarantee that the monies that you win under a Clean Water Act lawsuit or a Clean Air Act lawsuit or a National Environmental Policy Act lawsuit actually goes back to restoring the ecosystem or nature itself. That always sounds strange to say, but unless there's some kind of settlement that happens before a ruling comes down, that the ruling itself, the monies go into the general treasury of the United States. They may never even be applied to restore a damaged ecosystem. So built into these laws is a remedy uh, based on this concept of restoration of the ecosystem. So again, uh, just uh, these three elements are embedded in most, uh, almost all rights of nature laws, municipal laws in the US that have been passed. Declaration of rights, recognition of standing to sue on behalf of the ecosystem, and a requirement of remedy, including this requirement of restoration to pre-damaged state. So enforcement of rights of nature laws. People ask, well, where have these been enforced? You know, we know what the law says, but where have these actually been enforced? Where has there actually been a change on the ground? So until recently, there were no rights of nature enforcement cases in the US, uh, this direct enforcement uh, of these rights of nature laws, but that has changed. There's now several examples. Uh, and the first case study really comes out of Florida. So remember Orange County, uh, voters passing a voter initiative to adopt a law recognizing the rights of certain waterways within that county. That gave birth to a lawsuit, and the lawsuit is known as Wild Cypress Branch versus Beachline South Residential LLC, and was filed in 2021. It was filed to enforce the Orange County Charter Amendment, this law that was passed within Orange County. It was brought against both a developer who is proposing to fill in over 100 acres of wetlands and other waters to build a 1900 acre housing commercial development uh, and against the uh, state itself, which has to issue a permit to the developer, something called a dredge and fill permit uh, for the developer to do what he wants to do. So the lawsuit was filed in state court in Florida to stop the filling of the wetlands because under the law, the wetlands have a right to life. And it's, it always sounds odd to say it that way, but wetlands and waterways have this right to exist. So when you're killing them by filling them in and destroying their existence, you have a confrontation between the law that was passed and the actual act of what the developer wants to do on the ground in Florida. So the case was brought against both entities. Uh, the first set of claims uh, was filed directly against the developer to try to stop him from uh, destroying these waters, which are now protected by the Rights of Nature initiative that was passed within Orange County. And specifically, you see some of the claims here, uh, filling wetlands violates their right to exist, their impacts on other creeks and lakes, including their right to be free of pollution flow and maintain a healthy ecosystem. And the claim, first set of claims, asked the court to enjoin or stop the developer from being able to proceed with the project because it violated, it will violate those rights. And the second set of claims were brought against the state because the state has to permit uh, the actual project. And so uh, the issue was whether the state agency, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, could issue a permit to allow the violation of legal rights, which had now been established by the Orange County Charter Amendment. So that's a wild cypress case in Florida. In Pennsylvania, there's been a case that's been around for a long time now. I was, was the original lawyer on it uh, nine years ago now, uh, eight years ago now. And it dealt, deals with a small community in Pennsylvania uh, who adopted a local law banning frack wastewater injection wells. Folks who don't know what wastewater injection wells are, when you hydrofrack for natural gas, the large amounts of water that you use to do the 
to do the frac uh, injection, uh, comes back up. Some of it's radioactive, it's toxic, it's got a variety of different proprietary chemicals, nobody even knows what's in it. Uh, and then they take it out of the well and they find another well to inject it into. And one of those injection wells was planned for this small little township, Grant Township uh, in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, Grant Township passed the law that recognized the rights of nature and also banned these frac wastewater injection wells within the municipality. The uh, lawsuit, a lawsuit was filed by the energy company that leases the frac wastewater injection well. And no need to get caught up on the specifics, but just this is the company, Pennsylvania General Energy, uh, PGE, which sued the township, said you can't stop us from putting in the frac wastewater injection well because uh, it's legal and we have a permit from the state and you can't pass a local law that bans it from happening here. And during the process of that litigation, the uh, one of the streams, the Little Mahoning Creek, which was now protected by that local rights of nature law, brought an intervention motion to attempt to intervene in the underlying lawsuit. So again, just A plus B equals C, Grand Township uh, passes a law banning new frac wastewater injection wells. PGE, the energy company, sues them as part of the lawsuit. Uh, there's now this motion to try to participate in the lawsuit filed by one of the creeks that might be impacted by the frac wastewater injection well. Uh, and so that's a motion where you try to get into the lawsuit to defend your interests. Here, there was a creek attempting to defend its interests by getting involved with this particular lawsuit. Uh, this is just some of the stuff that the company said in opposition uh, that um, it was the first time in American jurisprudence, you know, a little over the top kind of stuff that the companies file, but uh, first time in American jurisprudence that a condition of nature, is how they described it, wants to intervene in a lawsuit. They also said watershed is not a person. Federal, federal rules of civil procedure, which define who can participate in a lawsuit, doesn't talk about nature or ecosystems, and therefore that the creek can't intervene. The judge uh, eventually denied the ability of the creek to intervene uh, and dodged the issue of whether an ecosystem could actually be a party uh, and instead held that the uh, presence of the municipal government, Grant Township, was sufficient to represent the interests of the creek. Uh, but again, kind of dodging the issue of whether uh, a, a, a creek, in this case a waterway, could become a party uh, to a particular lawsuit. Interestingly enough, because I was involved in the case early on, she allowed the creek to actually participate in phone calls through the creek's council and actually listed the creek for a short period of time as an intervener within some of the materials. So it was interesting to see how kind of leakage happened from the law into the litigation process for the judge to actually list that, that kind of thing. After the lower court judge denied the motion, it went up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, Third Circuit Court of Appeals uh, held that Rule 17, which is part of the civil procedure rules, uh, doesn't permit an ecosystem uh, to sue or be sued by anyone. Uh, but because the issue was not central to the actual appeal that had been brought because the decision by the lower court is really adequacy of representation of the township, and we're getting into the weeds here a little bit, but also dodged the question didn't take it on centrally uh, as to whether an ecosystem could be a party in that particular case. Uh, final case study dealt with the uh, Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Uh, 24 hours after the Lake Erie Bill of Rights passed in the city of Toledo, an agribusiness corporation brought suit uh, in federal court to try to overturn the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Uh, again, Lake Erie Bill of Rights adopted overwhelmingly by the voters of Toledo in 2019. Uh, this agribusiness partnership sued, uh, sought a federal court order invalidating the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Uh, also in that case, in uh, Lake Erie attempted to intervene. So Lake Erie as a party having rights under the law passed within the city of Toledo, uh, made a motion to intervene in the litigation uh, to actually become, to become a party to that lawsuit. Uh, this is the ruling of the district court, uh, held that the filing was meritless, uh, and uh, held that 
Uh, it didn't strictly hew to the language of the law itself, uh, which only talked about the lake representing itself in the county court, not in the federal court to where the case was eventually pulled. And so, again, in some ways, the court dodged the issue uh, and went back to specific language about where the lake could appear, uh, but held that it couldn't appear in federal court because of the way that the way that the ordinance was written. So just some early sparring around rights of nature laws, uh, not direct in not direct enforcement, at least in the Lake Erie case and the Grant Township case, but ways in which uh, ecosystems are starting to be seen in some ways through the litigation process by uh, moving to uh, intervene in those cases. Probably the most successful place uh, that rights of nature laws have been uh, enforced has been Ecuador. They were the first national constitution to incorporate rights of nature provisions into that national framework. In uh, 2008, uh, the Constitutional Assembly for the country of Ecuador voted to draft a new national constitution. They learned of rights of nature laws in the US that had been moving at that point uh, and asked us to come down and assist with the drafting of parts of the new constitutional uh, text. So we went to Quito and Montelis in Ecuador and served as a consultant to the Constitutional Assembly. This was the result of the work of the Ecuadorians uh, through that Constitutional Assembly, was to overwhelmingly adopt a new national constitution that contained for the first time anywhere at the national level, uh, rights of nature into their national constitution. And this is what it reads, that nature uh, has the right to integral respect for its existence and for maintenance and regeneration of the life cycle, structure, functions, and evolutionary processes. Uh, this is Article 72, a right to restoration, uh, and what that means in terms of compensation. Uh, Article 73 talked about preventive measures and uh, banning uh, genetically modified organisms, also made it into the Ecuadorian Constitution. Uh, standing provisions about who could enforce these new rights within the national constitution, basically giving that to all persons, communities, peoples, and nations. Uh, so recognizing standing within the constitutional framework for people to bring legal actions. There have been quite a few enforcement actions in Ecuador. We're going to cover them briefly before briefly turning to some other international stuff and then coming all the way back around. Um, in 2011, the first enforcement case was filed under the Ecuadorian provisions, and we've been going pretty fast here, but just to slow down a second, because this case was very important, you'll notice that the case name is the Vilcabamba River versus the province of Loja. The river itself, again, is the plaintiff. So we're used to seeing people or groups, organizations, companies uh, in that place, but this is the river itself suing a local government in Ecuador for dumping road debris. They were widening a road and dumping road debris into the river, thus changing the flow of the river. Um, two residents of the region brought an action under the Ecuadorian constitutional provisions in the name of the Vilcabamba River itself. Uh, and so this is the first rights of nature case that was brought under those Ecuadorian provisions. Uh, it was the first time that a judge has ruled in favor of an ecosystem. So ruling was made in favor of the Vilcabamba River, ordering the local government to fix the damage that it had caused and also to stop dumping debris into the river. So first, uh, I guess you could call winning case for an ecosystem under those new constitutional provisions, uh, the Vilcabamba River uh, litigation. Uh, and this was just the final order of the provincial court ordering that the local government uh, had to uh, restore of uh, the river itself to its prior functions before that road dumping occurred. And these are some of the other remedies, uh, remediation plan uh, and corrective actions taken to limit oil spills and those types of things around the river. So again, practical real life stuff coming out of this rights of nature enforcement uh, framework that was created within the Ecuadorian constitution. So some have called the Ecuadorian stuff a turn of Copernican proportions because it takes people out from the middle of this kind of right to and replaces it with a right of. Uh, this is just a very quick summary of some of the cases where it's touched ground. The Vilcabamba River case was the first. There's been cases dealing with shrimp farming and revoking shrimp farming permits. 
in the Galapagos. Uh, it's been applied to deal with shark finning uh, in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, most recently, in the Los Cedros case, uh, the Ecuadorian Constitutional Court, the highest court in the land looking at constitutional issues, uh, threw out mining permits on the basis that they violated the rights of the forest ecosystem under the Ecuadorian constitutional provisions. And these are some of the doctrines that the lawyers talk about, uh, that nature is a subject of rights, people have the standing to invoke those rights, and there's been widespread applications in civil, criminal, administrative, and operational laws. So it, it's really gotten legs in Ecuador uh, through these constitutional provisions. I'm gonna run through these very quickly and then turn it over to, to Frank uh, to talk. Um, so it's not just Ecuador that has begun to embrace this kind of rights of nature approach. In India, uh, and to our surprise, I think, a lot of these places have moved without legislation. So up until this point, you've had local laws in the US You've had the Ecuadorian national constitution, but they've all been written text. So legislation passed, whether those were constitutional provisions or just laws. Uh, starting in 2017, uh, courts in India began recognizing rights of nature for different rivers, glaciers, and other ecosystems through court decree, holding that the Ecuadorian rights of nature, jurisprudence, and language <clears throat> was essentially establishing a new international norm of environmental law. And they were they began to borrow that and apply it to cases that they were already hearing. So in 2017, a high court of one of the states in India, so a local government in India, but kind of akin to state governments here, recognized that the Ganges River had certain rights. Then the court also recognized rights of the animal kingdom. Other high courts recognizing animals as legal persons. A uh, lake uh, in a specific area of India was declared to be a legal person uh, for purposes of uh, projects that were going on around the lake. So India has become a hotspot for some of this emerging rights of nature jurisprudence. Colombia, the Colombian Constitutional Court, again, the highest uh, court dealing with constitutional issues in Colombia, has recognized the Atrato River, the Amazon River, and the Amazon River Basin as having rights. So in 2016, 2018, and continuing today, uh, that courts in Colombia have begun to recognize specifically waterways, mostly rivers, uh, but also basins as being a subject of rights. So recognizing rights-bearing entities, these waterways being rights-bearing entities. Uh, Colombia, the story continues, 2019, 2020, again, uh, in this case, the Colombian Supreme Court uh, took up this kind of constitutional court jurisprudence and began recognizing uh, different parks as having rights, along with different rivers having rights, but continuing the evolution of that jurisprudence. In Bangladesh in 2019, the high court recognized the legal rights of all rivers within the country. So again, this concept of rivers having rights, um, expansion of rights of nature jurisprudence. Other legislation, moving very quickly through these, Bolivia has a national rights of Mother Earth law. People may have heard about New Zealand, uh, where a river has been recognized as a legal person, and a former national park has been recognized as, as being a legal person. Several governments, local governments in Brazil, uh, recognizing uh, rights of nature. Uh, Mexico, a local government in Australia about uh, passed a, a measure integrating the rights of nature into its municipal planning operations. Just last year, the two local governments, two governments in Canada, one an indigenous government and one a European government, adopted the first rights of nature law in Canada protecting the Magpie River, which is now threatened with hydroelectric uh, development. So all the way around back to Wisconsin, one of the questions we get when we do the PowerPoint is, okay, so what? Uh, these places have done it. You know, we have some jurisprudence now. We have other places that have passed up. What can we do in Wisconsin? And we can talk more about this later, but this just lays the keel for that conversation. Uh, but rights of nature laws can be moved at the municipal level in Wisconsin. You're one of the states that has the, um, the good stuff which is that you can actually adopt laws at the municipal level in certain municipalities without having your elected officials pass them. 
So you have a variety of options. One is elected officials in cities, towns, and villages in Wisconsin can actually take these rights of nature laws and pass them and apply them to specific waterways or ecosystems within those communities. But you have this other option available since rights of nature is still kind of radioactive for many elected officials to touch uh, that residents of cities and villages have a state guaranteed initiative process in Wisconsin uh, that may be used to pass law over the heads of your elected officials. So you can actually propose laws directly to the ballot and then vote on them, like what's happened in Florida and, and many other places. And this just a last note here about signatures and a number exceeding 50% of votes cast for governor. That's the standard uh, and collected within uh, two months uh, period of time. So these are some of the options that are available in Wisconsin. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Frank uh, to be the main event here. Thomas, you did have some questions in the chat too. I don't know if you want to hold off till the very end for that or. Uh, yeah, that's fine. That's fine with us. We want to hold off. Yeah, whichever way, if they look relevant, we can look at them too, because I don't always look at them either. So. Nothing, something. Yeah, I think it's okay to wait till the end, I guess. Okay, okay. All right, don't mind me. I'm going to turn my TV set up off over here because I can see everything better on a bigger screen. So now I'm back to the little screen that everybody looks at, and I got to pull my glasses out like everybody. So good evening. My name is Frank Bebo. I live here in, in uh, northern Minnesota. I've been uh, working on line three and rights of Monoman for, God, it seems like forever. The rights of Monoman was adopted and passed by the 1855 Treaty Authority which I serve as executive director, and that was in 2018. And the White Earth Band also adopted the rights of Monoma, a slightly different version for on reservation. And Tom talked about these different laws, you know, and, and sometimes I think, you know, we're, we're doing something that's kind of out in front, but then I, when I listen and watch what Tom's presenting, it's happening all over the world. And when I have an opportunity to speak to other uh, uh, groups, I find that I've you know, do speak all over the world. And I also see that um, law schools and even lawyers are starting to look at this a lot more. I've, uh, I've had the opportunity to speak to a number of law schools, um, you know, Cornell, Yale, Harvard, um, U of M right here in Minnesota, every, everyone almost. And so I think everybody is looking for a different way to solve our problems, including judges. And judges, um, they usually feel constrained by the law when they write their decisions. And so sometimes, you know, what Tom's talking about is we're constrained by federal and state law, and those laws are set up for permitting. And so I was, I was listening uh, at the beginning there, and I, I sometimes get a kick out of the Sierra Club dis, um, decision back in 1972. And when I used rights of Monoman to sue the Department of Natural Resources for the state of Minnesota, um, a couple of years ago, one of the cases that I cited to at the end was was citing to the 1972 Sierra Club decision. And it was kind of interesting because at that time, I believe it was 2016, there was a case for permitting going on in the state of Virginia when President Trump had come into office and the Department of Interior, I believe, was representing. And they had gone from all of the normal kind of what I would call proactive methods to protect the environment to saying, oh, it doesn't really matter. Go ahead and do what you want um, with those other appointees. And the judge was very shocked and surprised. And he cited to the Sierra Club decision and specifically asked who will speak for the trees and cited to the Lorax. And so that case has been revived. And I use that case because I knew if I was going to federal court, I'd like to have a federal court case that I could cite to for rights of nature. And that's what those cases are. Those are rights of nature cases. So, so I'm enjoying that part. Part of what I also enjoy listening to and watching that I haven't always figured out myself is groundwater protection strategies. And we're developing them in probably a couple of different ways, even here in Northern Minnesota. And so wild rice, 
or monoman as we call it, um, worked for us here for quite a while. And I think it's gonna continue. The thing about wild rice, and Tom talked about these aspects and I'll give it some life here. Um, for us as the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe, the Chippewa, however you like to refer to us, um, we're called the Chippewa in all of our treaties. Our creation stories and our migration stories talk about coming through all of the Great Lakes in a quest for where the food grows on the water. And the food grew on the water, I'm, I'm, as I understand it, uh, even in Wisconsin area, um, in terms of Lake Michigan, Green Bay, Milwaukee, um, places in those larger bays, and, and all over Wisconsin and Northern Minnesota. And, and so in our 1837 treaty with the United States, which includes a lot of land from Wisconsin and some land from Minnesota, in Article 5, we specifically reserve the rights to hunt, fish, and gather wild rice on the lakes, rivers, and lands that were being seeded. And that statement may not have seemed like much maybe at the time, except for a, a food hunt um, ability, but in reality, that is a water quality standard because if our primary tribal food, our, our I would call it maybe our most important spiritual food is in jeopardy and we don't have the ability to harvest it anymore, then our rights to harvest have also been taken either by other governments or, the, or needs to be protected by the federal government. And so wild rice to me was a natural and it took a little bit um, to get there for me. Um, and it probably takes all of us through rights of nature. And that's the great thing about having Tom and Mari help out. So the rights of nature with wild rice starts in my mind with a treaty right. And treaties are the supreme law of the land. And that made a big difference for me as an attorney looking to argue these concepts in tribal court. And tribal courts are still very young on time, 20, maybe 30 years for some of them, but a lot of times it's about 20, 25 years for the ones here in Minnesota. And we haven't gone that far yet into figuring out how to make laws that we might be able to actually apply to protect our environment. We don't have as much jurisdiction over non-Indians, and we certainly don't have as much jurisdiction over non-Indians off reservation, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. And, and that's what's important to remember. And so while the, the wild rice case, which I thought was you know, a pretty fantastic case in many ways, it died in a, in a, in a death that um, I, I would have never expected. And that was where the White Earth Tribal Court of Appeals determined that there was a lack of jurisdiction to be suing the state of Minnesota, I presume off reservation, because I don't know how it would be a problem on reservation. And we did try to have it reconsidered, but they wouldn't, uh, the panel wouldn't hear of it. And that was the end of our appeal rights. We don't have a Supreme Court. We just had the appellate court. So we learned a few lessons about things and what we need to watch out for. But I think at the same time, that, that I'll call it a volley, like a shot over the bow, that, that litigation really, I think, woke up the state of Minnesota and the Department of Natural Resources. And shortly after that, we got engaged uh, with the White Earth Band and with the Leech Lake Band and, and the 1855 Treaty Authority, as, as, as well as other groups, Red Lake, with a project called Huber Mill. And this Huber Mill was a wood processing plant that they were going to put in Cohasset, Minnesota, very close to the Leech Lake Reservation. And, and it, would take, it would take timber, according to its plan, within 100 miles of its center point. And that's our habitat for all the food that we hunt, fish, and gather. And, and that's where we need to have clean water. And they were gonna put this wood plant right on the Mississippi River, even though it didn't need to be there. And that's ultimately what killed it. I think they overreached and maybe thought that would be a nice spot to have an operation, even though it wasn't necessary. And so they, they lost. They lost that and they've already had to pack up and go home. But, but that's, 
that's only a small piece. The interesting part about the challenge was the city of Bemidji, which may you may have heard that name before. The city of Bemidji also has a couple of timber mills in it. Grand Rapids has timber mills. Uh, they're, they're in a number of places still in Minnesota. And the city of Bemidji challenged the state's um, waiver, essentially the legislature, to try to waive an EIS for this project. And, and so you end up, you find out that the legislature who should be protecting your environment isn't. You find out that other cities who have economic interests are more aligned with your interests. And, and as you find, and part of what Tom was talking about, is that water becomes more and more important. And it's a question of who's going to step up and take, take, uh, take an effort against that. One of the other things that's been happening out in the White Earth area, and White Earth White Earth Reservation is right by the Laurentian Divide. And, and in Wisconsin and here in northern Minnesota, we think of the Laurentian Divide, the water either going up to Hudson Bay or down to uh, the Gulf and to the Atlantic Ocean. And, and where that Laurentian Divide also is, um, the water goes to the Red River and then north into Canada. And they're looking at, and we've all, all heard of these things, I'll just talk about it a little bit, what they call CAFO now concentrated animal feeding operations. That's where you have a bazillion cows in a little fence being fed all the time and giant piles of cow manure and everything else going on and they're feeding them right there in these concentrated lots. And it's it's damaging to the environment. It's, it's a lot of uh, risk to the groundwater and, and running off into the other watersheds and ultimately getting to the Red River getting into Canada and going to Hudson Bay. It's the same story we have everywhere. And so there was a, uh, a moratorium that White Earth put, put into place here just recently, and it did stop one of the projects that was going, going to be proposed. Interestingly, the timber mill project um, at Huber, that wasn't a state agency that was proposing that project. After the Line 3 project, where we had about a seven or eight year fight with the state of Minnesota and the Public Utilities Commission, neither the DNR or the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency were the permitting agency or the regional uh, governmental unit. It ended up being the city of Cohasset because I don't think the state wanted to come out and champion this themselves, but they had to let the permit go. PAFO was probably gonna be the same thing. We also have Talon mining going on. So we're facing not just Talon mining, but that's the one in my watershed area. Um, we're facing all the same things that are happening in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin has also had some interesting case law in the past. And one of them would be with Mole Lake with the mining. And I'm sure a lot of people in Wisconsin remember that. One of the things that happened as a result of the Mole Lake mining was, was essentially stopping that operation. Now, Mo Lake ended up having to come up with the money to buy out the operation, but the Corps of Engineers had to acknowledge in 1997 that our rights to hunt, fish, and gather are the same on reservation as off reservation. Animals move, waters move, things migrate. And so you have to be able to go where things are to find them. And the way our treaties were written, like I said, with the 37, the ability to hunt, fish, and gather in the territory being seated, not in the little box reservation or something like that. The, all of the area that we were giving up, we said we still have to have for our, our food to be able to live, to have our way of life. And so those treaties aren't like a lot of other treaties in the United States. In fact, the Chippewa have 44 treaties with the United States. And early on, uh-oh, oh, well, there we go. I don't know. Is that my computer or somebody else's computer? We can okay. still hear you fine. We, you're fine. You're fine. You, you didn't change any. Okay, I'm just watching my picture get smaller and bigger and disappearing. So, um, all right. I'm just trying to go back into my head there where I was for a second. I got caught off guard. But, uh, oh yeah, so with Mo Lake and stuff and the, and the Corps of Engineers, but that was 1997. And unfortunately we've tried to get the Corps of Engineers to go to the next level. Because the Malak decision, which it's more commonly known here in Minnesota, also applied to a lot of the tribes in Wisconsin. And what they discovered was when they were trying to pigeonhole us into these smaller areas for resources, was that all of the lands, and this is in the 1842 treaty, which is primarily in Northern Wisconsin, 
all of the lands that had been ceded and all the lands that were yet to be ceded by the Chippewa were then considered held in common by all of the Chippewa of the Mississippi and of Lake Superior. And so all of a sudden, instead of suggesting that we have little spots to occupy and use for harvesting and protect, the United States through its treaty making understood that we really had one giant territory that was about 800 miles across through most of the Great Lakes where we hunt, fish and gather, and that those rights are interchangeable amongst all of us everywhere. And that's different than almost any other kind of treaties that you're familiar with in the United States. And that's also what makes our treaties, I think, much stronger and better um, to use these arguments for rights of nature. We had a case um, a few years ago, we call square hook up here uh, locally. And what it had to do with was a, a number of tribal members who were netting large fish, any fish, but they were netting large fish, say trophy size fish on Leech Lake Reservation uh, over at White Earth and, and uh, Red Lake. And they were selling these fish to non-Indians who would get them mounted to put up on their walls. And the Lacey Act was being used against us um, which was originally a bird act, but for uh, migratory game and things like that, because we were engaged in selling it. And they had a lot of tribal members who were who were tagged for exercising these rights, but ultimately, and it took a little while, ultimately the federal court understood and described how our rights are exclusive from the state of Minnesota and from the United States of America, because when they made that 1842 treaty that said our rights were in common with each other out in Washington area, um, Columbia River, those treaties talk about the rights to fish being in common with the citizens of the territory or in common with the citizens of the United States. And so the non-Indians, the white people had a treaty right back in 1854-55 out on the Western states to co-manage the fishing resource. And that's how they got rights to control some of that. Whereas with us, our rights are exclusive from both of those entities. And that means that they can't exactly control what we're doing in the same way. And that's what makes this, I think, a, a better forum to work from um, with litigation purposes. Because what we were really trying to do was, well, we're probably trying to do several things, but part of it was we wanted to have tribal court establish how we understood our law, how we were implementing the protection of our law, and to develop the jurisdiction and, and the other factual basis for uh, why, why what the DNR was wrong, why it was violating our laws, and, and so forth. And that hadn't really been done anywhere in a tribal court. And typically, um, there was another case that happened very close in time with Sox Seattle out, out in Washington State. And, and they were suing on behalf of, of uh, the fish out there, the salmon in the river, because, because the city of Seattle has three hydroelectric dams that are preventing the water, um, the way they're holding the water, preventing the fish from really being able to migrate up to where they're supposed to. And salmon are their primary treaty food and the fish aren't getting there. And what fish are getting there are scarce. And so they're not able to enjoy their right. That right is the supreme law of the land. And so the, in, in that case, even though they didn't have a written law, they were using customary law and, and tribal, tribal customs in terms of how they were explained and the feelings. Um, the federal court, when Seattle took those, uh, the Sox Seattle, the federal court and said, hey, they're suing us in tribal court over salmon here and we don't think they have jurisdiction. The federal court said, hey, you're gonna have to participate in that case in federal court and we'll wait to see how that plays out. And that's what we were trying to do because the federal courts give deference to tribal courts if in fact the laws you know, are, are, I guess what I would call valid and in place and all the other laws that are going on to give the tribal court the right to have first impression and to declare what they think the outcome should be. And so you're gonna see more of that happening. That's what we tried with the, with the wild rice. Now the wild rice, it's only had one shot and I'm hoping that we have an opportunity to do something similar like this with Bad River and Red Cliff out in Wisconsin, because Bad River, that's a big wild rice, big wild rice reservation. They have the same kind of concepts about wild rice that we have. 
And, and so when I say the same kind of concepts and I was talking about the migration stories and, and where we came to where the food grows on the water, you know, the creation stories talk about, talk about the creator having to petition all of the other living beings on the planet to see if it was okay if we came to also live on the planet and to use them as sustenance and to help support us in the way that we were living on the planet. And as part of that covenant, we have an obligation to remember that there are relatives and that we have to watch out and protect for them. This is the first law with the creator. In order for us to live, we recognize that everything else that was here before us has a right to live as well. And so when Thomas is talking about all of these concepts being translated into to mainstream dominant law, these are these are what our laws are about already. And, and so for me, you know, the great thing about rights of monoman with wild rice, because of, because of what it is, where it grows, who we are, I wasn't having to make up anything that wasn't already in place and wasn't already true. And essentially almost every member of the Chippewa nation would have guessed this law should exist just based on our, our cultural and spiritual rights and beliefs. And so everything is there to carry this out. It's just that it's in a tribal court, but it doesn't mean it's the wrong place. It just hadn't been tried. And so when Thomas talks about standing, you know, when I was looking at wild rice and, and rights of uh, wild rice and water, you know, in, in tribal court, when I look at standing, Indian tribes and people, Indian people have water rights. The state has some water rights and the feds have some water rights, but something like Enbridge, a pipeline company, they don't have any water rights. They're a pipeline company. So they don't even have standing necessarily, you know, so if you don't sue them, they're gonna have to intervene. And I wasn't suing them. I was suing the DNR because they were giving 5 billion gallon water permit to Enbridge for their directional drilling, for their fracking operations and everything else, because they're the culprit who was allowing all of this environmental damage. Enbridge is just doing what it naturally does. It, it could be a wolf in the environment eating its prey. It's doing what it does and it got permission from the state. The state is who I'm concerned about. The state is the one who's in competition for the same resources that we rely on to hunt, fish and gather. And the state, as far as I'm concerned, is letting these waters become impounded. They're letting you're letting the populations of different animals decline. And so the state is the culprit to me. The problem is the way the dominant laws are set up, it makes it a lot harder to go after the state using state law and using federal law because they've got all the laws set up to protect themselves. For us, we were able to make what I would call some simple laws. And, and so the rights of Manoman, um, is very simple in, in the in in how it works for us, but as I look to the future and I look what happened with Sox Seattle and the rights of salmon, um, the salmon in Idaho were on Tom's list, and there's other places like that. I think rights of fish are really the most important, or are going to become the most important, because almost every tribe has a right to hunt fish and gather. They don't have wild rice, but they have fish, and 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 almost. All of them, I would guess, have relied on fish for sustenance along the way. They have um, uh, creation stories or spiritual stories that talk about fish. For the Chippewa, the Ojibwe, we have clan groups. We have, we have the Eagle Clan. We have the Martin Clan. We have the Fish Clan. And so when I was imagining the rights of fish and you try to figure out who has a right to speak for the fish, most logically, it would be the members of the fish clan who already have a more direct relationship with the fish than the rest of us who might be in the bear clan or the eagle clan or the wolf clan. And so they might be the first line of defense for petitioners in an action like this. They may have, they may have something more that they understand than the average person would about how we're connected to fish and why they're so important. But fish are important to me as a barometer. And, and I say that because everybody knows what a fish looks like. Everybody knows what a dead fish looks like. 
and everybody knows what a thousand dead fish looks like. And when they see that, they go, huh, there must be something wrong with the water. But unfortunately, we're still at a time where that short, simple analysis lasts for the news cycle or two. And so when you look at that uh, East Palestine, um, I don't know if I'm saying Palestine right there, but um, with the rail car spill, they said there was 45,000 fish and other animals that were killed. Didn't mean a thing. Because there's other things that people think are more important. So even though a big number was alarming about, you know, chickens on a farm dying, you know, people's, people's farm animals dying. You start thinking about all these things. It's obvious there's been a release of something. Everyone knows it. Everyone in that community knows it. Nobody believes the EPA or the railroad is telling all the truth because you can see the reality of what's happening around you. You don't have to come in with some little gas sniffer and say, oh no, it's only two parts per billion. You'll be just fine. Other things have died quickly. So you have to think about nature as that barometer is how I see it. And nature, nature talks to us. We just don't listen very much anymore. But I see, I see the rights of nature as the right vehicle here in the United States because of the way um, tribal law can operate. And we're just at the beginning of doing what we're doing. Um, one of the other uh, things that's happened that I thought was really, uh, uh, I guess I'll just call very supportive, uh, a friend of mine who's a tribal attorney and is uh, teaching at a law school out in uh, Montana, he wrote essentially the, um, a law review on the jurisdiction of wild rice on reservation and off reservation while our case was going on. There are people motivated by this who are compelled to try to figure out how to help. I think in a way, that's what the two tribal judges did at White Earth as well. They could see all the pieces were there, the obviousness of what was going on and how important it was to the Ojibwe people, the Chippewa people, the wild rice and what was happening to the harvest and what was happening to the water. It's essential, it's critical. You, you can't live without it. And, and so those, those are the concepts that have to be employed right away if you're going to try to defend your environment. I, I, I've lost faith in the state, you know, as, as a protection agency, and I've lost faith in the federal government as a protection agency. And, and I think that's been demonstrated by the fact that I've, I've gone all the way through law school and looked at what they've got and gone to figure out how to create laws in a tribal court in a tribal setting because I think that there's a better chance of having that be successful and being supported in a logical way by humans, as opposed to the rigmarole sometimes of all the process that a, a permitting agency puts you through. We were at the PUC for seven years. Seven years, we didn't stop them. The permitting process was supposed to, I think do the route permit in nine months, and, and the uh, certificate of need in 12 months and they were going to do it simultaneously. So we were able to stand up and defend our territory for a lot of years, but unfortunately it was the federal government, some of the elections and who were in power maybe at the time, because when we needed to have an EIS done in the last hours of the Trump administration in November, we didn't get an EIS from the federal government to protect our resources. And when, the new Biden administration came in after that election in November of 2020. They didn't ask for one either. And so we're having to operate as though the federal government isn't here to defend our trust responsibility that they have to watch out for our rights and resources. Just like everybody else in Wisconsin and everywhere else, we have to defend our own rights and watch out for ourselves. The problem is where can we go to do it and how can we make it as legally strong and sound as possible? Because you can see, like Tom said, there was 89% of those people in that Florida area that wanted their water protected. And they couldn't find a way to do it in a meaningful way. And so we have to continue to try. And that's, that's why I stay involved. I, you know, I don't feel like I really lost anything in what I'm doing. If anything, I'm reinvigorated and I can see where some other opportunities are, are out there. And I know other people that need help and want to try it. And that's probably the most important part um, of not feeling like there isn't a way or a solution.
It's just that we have to look at the problem in a way that doesn't rely on the normal legal mechanisms of the federal and state governments. So I don't know if I've talked very much or too long or, or a little bit. Are there any questions at this point before I keep talking? Hey, Frank, there was a question in the chat about the Eighth Circuit case. Uh -huh. Eighth, and uh, can you talk a little bit about how that concluded? Oh, yeah. Well, the Eighth Circuit case, you know, that that was uh, when we were suing Whiter or when Whiter's we were suing when White Earth and Monoman was suing DNR in, in tribal court, the first thing the state wanted to do was go to federal court and say, hey, don't let those Indians sue us in tribal court. And the lower level of the district court, the, the judge asked the DNR to point to or cite to some law that says that the federal court has jurisdiction to tell the Indians and the tribal court that they can't sue the DNR. And the DNR didn't have any answer for him. And I'm sure that shocked, shocked them having to say that out loud. And the, and the lower court dismissed the case. But DNR did appeal that as well because they wanted to essentially try to get a decision that said that we couldn't sue them. The litigation continued in tribal court as well. But ultimately, as I said towards the beginning, it was our own White Earth Tribal Court of Appeals that made a ruling that we didn't have jurisdiction. And not only did they make a ruling that we didn't have jurisdiction, but they decided to dismiss the case from the appellate court level rather than even sending it down to the lower court for more fact finding on jurisdiction or anything like that. And so when that happened, that decision became the vehicle or the tool that the DNR pointed to that basically said, well, look, even the White Earth Tribal Court of Appeals says that they don't have jurisdiction. And so we were kind of stuck. We didn't have another way to really appeal that seemed, seemed like it was going to work in that way. If our own court wasn't supporting what was going on at the Tribal Court of Appeals level, um, then we weren't going to get there on that try that we could see. And so we basically had to accept that that case was going to die where it did. That case is at White Earth Tribal Court. Um, but, you know, in, in Minnesota, there's a lot of reservations. And, and so it's like states. So if you got rights of fish, you could try rights of fish. You could try it at Red Lake. You could try it at Leech Lake. You could try it at Bad River. You can take rights of Monoman and you can go to Bad River. Because those decisions that the White Earth Tribal Court of Appeals ruled on, while people might look to it as persuasive or a guide, it's still a case of first impression at the tribal court at Red Lake or at Leech Lake or at Bad River. And it's a federal law, or not a federal law, but it's a federally protected law because they're tribal laws. And so um, that, makes, that makes this more important to try again and to try to get it right in a different forum. Because I suspect that it's going to be tribal law in a tribal forum that's really going to grab a hold of the environmental protection. It'll probably be Bad Rivers, my hope, because of the wild rice that's there. But because of uh, all the fishing that goes on over at uh, Red Cliff and Bad River and other places along the lake, I think all those Chippewa tribes are open to looking at rights of uh, nature, rights of fish, and rights of monoma. And I and I'm glad to see that there is a way for our, our spiritual beliefs to play an important role in protecting the way we're supposed to according to our agreements prior to, you know, the creation of the United States and other things, our agreements with nature, our agreements with the creator. So it's an interesting way to, to solve a puzzle and maybe it's the right way to go about it because you know, the laws don't protect nature. And if we don't have water, if we don't have clean air, which a lot of people tell me are civil rights for humans, then we're not going to make it ourselves. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Okay, Dixie, I see that. My dog's right here. <laughs> so I think, I think Frank's being a bit humble about what uh -oh. Uh -oh. transpired because just, just to put it in a slightly different context, the state of Minnesota was so afraid of what was going to happen with the tribal court around the rights of nature and tribal treaty enforcement stuff that was being brought that they sued the court, which is the way it works. They sued the court in, in federal court 
they actually dragged the tribe into or tried to drag the tribe into federal court to try to use the federal court to stop the tribal court from asserting jurisdiction over this particular case. So just to be crystal clear, that's that's the kind of response that the work drew, which was the state of Minnesota running to federal court to try to get a federal judge to stop the tribal court from moving forward with the case. And that, I'm fairly cynical at this point about the way things work, but even I was shocked that the state government went to federal court to try to stop the tribe from actually hearing the case in the tribal court. That was that was big to me. Yeah. And then the courts didn't give them what they wanted until the tribal court mm -hmm. of appeals. Right. right. So, the, go ahead, Tom. Frank, we had another question come in about um, how the rights of nature movement relates to the current fight for tribal sovereignty. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the overlap? Oh, yeah, I think I think they're they're hand in hand. You know, we we don't always understand how to use our sovereignty in a way that is, I guess I would call it protective of the environment off reservation and and how we can use our value system to protect those rights. And and so when I when I look at where the rights of nature are, are, I guess, going with this, I think sovereignty, because of the concept of treaties being the supreme law of the land, uh, it's going to make it almost impossible at some point. We haven't figured out the path. We've only, for us, we've only tried once, and we're not even all the way through our rights of monomena attempt. And I think I think it's just a matter of. I'll just use the term more more powered sovereignty because the other thing that happened with the eighth circuit court of appeals is seven other chippewa bands came out with an amicus brief in support of what we were doing because they understood the rights that we were trying to also exercise and avail ourselves of from white earth and most of those tribes were from wisconsin because they have the same exact treaty rights that we have because all of our rights are in common so those bands in Wisconsin, you know, Wisconsin should also know that that same case that we went through in the Eighth Circuit, because, you know, Wisconsin's in the Seventh Circuit, could very well end up in the same way. But the pattern is the federal courts say, let the tribal court matter go all the way through first and see what they come to as a decision before we see if we have to step in. And so I think that if we can have two or three circumstances working against uh, Line 5, the uh, Mackinac Straits with the bridge and the pipeline crossing, um, I think there's a way to actually bring this to a stop with the states and with other people. But the problem is, is we have to be aggressive and we have to get those rights together. Spring's coming. I think that, uh, I think there's a new dawn coming and it should not be done. And I think that you're gonna see that we are going to use our sovereignty in a way, and I'll call it soft sovereignty, um, to make governments have to do the right thing to protect the environment, whether it's the EPA, whether it's the Corps of Engineers, or even state agencies. And, and I think because of the international, um, I'll just call it more internationalness, greater internationalness, um, with Canada on the other side of the lakes and things like that, that there should be a better chance to prevent these things from happening because it's more than just US citizens, state citizens, Indians and nature. It's also an international problem. And so there should be some other laws that help us um, along the way. But at the end, it's probably gonna be tribal law and sovereignty and tribal court that makes the biggest difference in the beginning to make the law go through and be successful at the end of federal court. That's what I believe is gonna happen. And I think Tom would tell you the same thing. We're working with tribes more than non-Indian groups because the supremacy of laws are so hard to go through already. And we don't have the same kind of lawmaking requirements. You know, We don't have a season for it. We can make a law when we need the law. So I think we're more nimble. I think we're more adept. I don't think we have all the baggage of all these other courts and all these other uh, decisions in the past that people look for for precedent to say why it's okay to continue to harm the environment so 
I think there's a target rich environment out there. And I think there's a lot of uh, healthy spots called reservations and tribal governments and courts that are going to step up and make the difference. So we're going to turn it back over to Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine, I know we have a little bit of time left. Do you want to facilitate what we do in the last piece? Sure. Yeah. Thank you both for presenting. That was great. Um, and I know I sent this in the email, but as a thank you for presenting as well, we're going to be giving you both a year membership to Sierra Club. So, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Is that Wisconsin or national? I'm national. <laughs> It should be Wisconsin, just so you both have to come visit, right? Right. There you go. <laughs> um, I do. I did copy all the questions that I, I am not a hundred percent sure if they were um, answered yet or not. I cross out the ones that we have gotten. So if you both wanted to answer these again, if you uh, would like as well, I can do that. So um, I can start from the most recent, since that would be like. The most relevant, um, it looks like Barbara just wrote, do you see rights of wild rice being used against sulfide mining in Minnesota? That's the most logical place for it to happen and it has been happening. And that's because of the, the sulfide, um, you know, byproducts and things like that from the mining that get released into the water and into the air. And some of that stuff makes acid rain even and stuff. So yeah, I, I think it's already there. About, I'm going to say, 2019, 2020, the Minnesota legislature basically commanded the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to try to avoid the sulfite standard or sulfate standard that they established 40 years ago. And because they wanted to do it for mining up on the range. And the administrative law judge wrote a long opinion about whether or not you could redo or circumvent or do something else with that standard and what they said was essentially that you were violating federal law because you already registered your sulfate standard with the epa 40 years ago and under federal law you can't relax the standard more you can only make it more stringent and we knew that as tribal members and as indians but yet the state citizens still wanted to try to make that happen and and so they're going to try again that's that's what they want to do. I don't know how they're going to do it because it's a violation of federal law. It's a violation of treaty rights and other things. But people don't want to hear that answer. They want to think that someone out there is going to try to still work around existing um, standards like that. And that standard, it's not sufficient, I don't think, because we're still losing wild rice. And that's the primary culprit. So it's hard to use it in an environment and say where it's been exceeded and it's probably harder to even say and that's the culprit for killing off wild rice in a certain area because wild rice unfortunately or fortunately also has the ability to disappear for a while and they say that the seed can lay dormant on the bottom of the lake um, or river um, for like up to 17 years and re-germinate and i've seen lakes myself that people thought that the rice was dead in one year suddenly it's covered with rice again so it's not a accurate, timely barometer. It's a slow barometer. And that's why, again, why I like rights of fish, because I think it's a lot more nimble standard fish. You can see it's alive when it's alive and things like that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um... Howard, a while back, had wrote that he had a question about river riparian rights and protection, but that was all he wrote. So, Howard, if you're still on and wanted to say what your question was. Yeah, I, I am. Hi, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a aquatic ecologist for quite a number of years. And um, it's a little bit of a ramble question, but I, when I'm comparing Western water law with Eastern water, water law, Eastern water law is... Um, riparian protection. Now, it seems to me that that's a halfway foot in the door of rights of nature anyway. I mean, we're giving water the right, the riparian water has to be as good leaving a town as going into the town, leaving a permit as going out of the permit. Doesn't it seem like that's half of the way through rights of nature already 
established in riparian law, and it's just a question of calling it rights of nature as as calling it riparian water law, aren't they kind of the same thing? And can't we use that in these cases? I mean, isn't it already long term established, but we're just not calling it the right thing. So there, that's kind of my rant. There's there's some logic to all of that. I use both um, riparian rights and first in time because uh, under the uh, oh what the heck there it'll come back to me. But anyway, um, the decision back in like 1906 there with the Winters decision, tribes are presumed to have uh, priority water rights because when Congress set aside a place for a reservation, it was presumed that Congress set aside sufficient water for the purposes of that reservation to be successful, which was usually a agrarian so in the case of leech lake reservation i would say 60 percent of that reservation is water and fish and so so i think we have a first in time right to protect those fish the riparian right that you're talking about is more like rights of nature and it's really the correct standard for everyone because the concept as you were talking about the water flowing in the water flowing out the way I've heard it, which is very similar, is you're supposed to leave the water in the condition that you got it so that the next person who comes along can enjoy it the same way you enjoy it. And that's really what it is. We forget that we're supposed to leave things in the fashion that we found them better off. And the people who think they have first in time priority rights and things like that, they think they can cut you off. They think they pollute the water. They can do all kinds of things because they have some other so-called individual property right and so riparian is a much better ally for what we're doing but at the same time because of the winter's decision i believe tribal rights are primary to anybody else who has first in time rights sometimes they don't always win in some of these old court cases and they may have to be refought but i think both of them work for tribes but riparian is the right standard because that's the one that says to leave the water like it should be for everybody else who comes after you. <clears throat> and that's the opposite of the Western water law. And that's what makes Western water law not work because they're fighting over things that don't even include letting it live. They're just, it, I think they fight over wet. They don't fight over quality water. They don't fight over abundance of water. They don't fight over anything like that. They're looking at their marinas and, and and places for their boats and stuff like that it seems like a lot of times so i think you're right about the question though i think uh riparian is the best standard any thoughts tom i, th I think there's a danger in conflating some of the existing regulatory standards that we have with rights of nature concepts and that's not about treating rights of nature with gloves and saying it's here and other stuff is below it but there have been efforts over the past 10 years to say like the endangered species act is really a rights of nature law well not really you know it's it's a rights of nature law when there are six six of them left you know, from an endangered species act perspective. But the deeper stuff is really troubling about how environmental laws have been passed in the United States. This is not a necessarily a topic for tonight, but the, the fact is, is that the U.S. Constitution doesn't recognize ecosystems or nature. It was written back in the 1780s. It's an archaic kind of document that treats, that really elevates the rights of property and commerce above even human rights to some extent, but certainly no mention of rights of nature or ecosystem. You know, the founding fathers didn't have a clue about deforestation or ocean acidification. It's like we're operating under an operating system that was built back in the 1780s, like Word, you know, Word 1.0 version. And so the, the question is what kind of bedrock changes have to be made? Because when Congress passes the Endangered Species Act, they're doing so under this provision of law called the Commerce Clause in the U.S. Constitution. It's all about, it's under their authority to regulate commerce. And how stupid it's gotten is, you know, even the US Supreme Court, they use this thing called a reasonable bird rule about whether a waterway can be regulated under the Clean Water Act is if a reasonable bird flying from one state to the other would actually land on that water body as, as a vehicle of commerce. 
That's the language that's used, is that the bird is a vehicle of commerce. And so it, it's really tough to say anything that we have within our existing system of law right now from an environmental perspective comes anywhere close to rights of nature because none of it is rights of, it's rights to. Even the most progressive stuff like the Green Amendment that's making the news in New York State and being, uh, maybe being passed other places, it's all about right to equal exploitation and for people to have that exploitation right protected equally across the board. Very little of it is about actually protecting nature for its own sake. And that's why we kind of have ended up in this place that we're at, which is in this environmental crisis that we don't seem to be, to, to, we don't even seem to be able to grapple with it in our own brains about what it's going to take to actually fix this place and not to use the language of saviors, but to save this place. We don't even, we don't even know. So over the years, Endangered Species Act, TMDLs, total maximum daily loads, which are basically about how much can we pollute a waterway without it dying? I mean, people say, well, that's rights of nature. No, it's not rights of nature. You know, <laughs> it's so we, we have to be careful about the language because I think there's a there's a tendency to dilute the concept when in reality, very few of these other things even have a taste of rights of nature in them. The fact that nature can be a rights bearing entity. So a lot of it comes back to water quality, rights of people to have high water quality exceptional water designation in Pennsylvania, people say, well, that's rights of nature. No, it's not rights of nature. It's, it's a regulatory construct that moves closer to rights of nature than other things, but it's still three football fields away from where it, where it ha actually has to be. So, you know, that's that's kind of my, my response. Work to do. Hey, it's getting pretty quiet. <laughs> oh, we have somebody raising their hand. Rose. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering a couple of things. I actually have a couple of questions. Um, how much momentum does the concept of rights of nature have right now as an idea? Probably the most momentum of any idea I've seen in the last 45 years. And does it need to have an impact on federal law in order to become more widespread in its application? No, I don't think so right now because tribes have all the authority in the world to pass. They're limited in some respects, at least under conventional law, about whether they and how far they can reach outside of boundaries of tribes. I mean, that's the whole focus of what Frank has brought to the work and melding tribal treaty rights with the rights of nature to extend the reach. But municipalities, like tomorrow, if a town or village in Wisconsin decided to adopt a rights of nature law, there's nothing to stop them. There's no preemptive law in Wisconsin that would prevent them from doing so. The Are you sure? Are you sure? Because our state legislature passed a law um, a few years back during the Walker administration saying that, for example, municipalities do not have the right to uh, say no to development, any development. If a developer wants to come into a municipality, they have to be allowed to do that as long as what they're doing doesn't necessarily go against state law, which is crazy. I mean, Minnesota is paradise compared to Wisconsin right now. Yeah, Wisconsin isn't the greatest, but at the same time, those are that that was a development statute aimed at a certain decision making process. In other words, a lot of times people say, well, we can't do we can't do that because we're constrained from doing it. The other place is you're constrained from doing it at this point, if if you actually accept how the system has delivered these kinds of structures, is Ohio, Florida, and Idaho which are three states where the state legislature has come in and passed laws that have that now prohibit municipalities from passing rights of nature laws. So, so, let, so talking about the concept, and I forget how the question was asked, but how much, how much strength it has at this point. The other side knows perfectly well how dangerous these laws are. But our own people, including most of the major environmental groups in the United States, still won't embrace the concept because it's too radical to a lot of folks, to, to my colleagues and peers in the NRDC. And, you know, I've represented the National Sierra Club before in litigation. And 
The Sierra Club itself as a national entity has not been very embracing of rights of nature concepts. So, so that's the first part is that, you know, the fact is, is that nothing changes without confrontation. You have to pick a fight. The, the White Earth Band picked a fight. You know, this round, it what didn't turn out the way they wanted it to, but there's plenty of rounds left in the game. That's how this works. But also, how long are we going to accept state legislatures telling our municipalities what they can and can't do? It, it kills me when, when people say, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. Well, okay, well, the earth is dying, you know, not to not to be, be too, you know, 30,000 foot academic here, but the earth is dying. We are in a crisis moment, a die off of 50% of species, climate change, which is the elephant in the room that nobody even has the faintest clue how to deal with. And the international negotiations aren't doing shit, excuse my French. So the fact is we're in this crisis, but the first thing that people say sometimes on the ground is, oh, we can't do that. We, we, we can't do that. The state has told us that we, we can't do that. Well, fuck the state, right? You know, we, it, it, the option is to sit back and do nothing or let these fatheads in the state legislatures actually control what happens in our communities, which is not acceptable either, right? And so we pioneered a legal strategy several years ago that's about a constitutional right to local self-government that we should have a constitutional right to actually determine the rules about what happens in our own communities. And I know I'm on a rant at this point, but let's continue for a moment, which is to say that we this is a democratic movement. It's not just a ecosystem nature protection movement, it's that too. But it's actually a democratic movement because we seem to have forgotten who we even are. Our, our governing documents say we the people, we have no idea who that is. And so we back off whenever Governor Ron DeSantis signs a law into place that says, you can't pass rights of nature laws. Well, screw you, Governor DeSantis, we're gonna do it anyway. And then we're gonna walk in and we're gonna try to get the courts to do something. And if they don't do something, we're gonna propose a constitutional amendment, which is what they're doing in Florida right now, is that they've moved to actually amend the state constitution with rights of nature principles, because that's what has to happen. We have to move out of this kind of defensive, always losing kind of mentality that we have and actually decide that we're going to be the law drafters, the law adopters, and the law enforcers. Otherwise, we're cooked. So it's all connected, you know. And a lot of people want to wait till the tribes to do something. You know, well, we're we're not, we're just watching the tribes to see what happens, and then we'll do something if the tribes are successful. Well, screw you, screw you on that one too. The tribes have been screwed over for the last 200 years. <laughs> Who are we to expect them to carry the burden that we should be carrying, right? And so it, it's great that White Earth, Yurok, the Yurok Nation, all these other tribes are moving forward with stuff. That's awesome because it makes sense and they have kind of leeway to move more of the municipalities, but we got to do it too. In Wisconsin, there needs to be a hundred rights of nature laws. Who's going to do the first one? Because in Wisconsin right now, there isn't even one. Not one in Wisconsin. After 10 years of talking to Wisconsin municipalities and elected officials and groups, not one municipal government has passed anything in Wisconsin. When is that going to change? So that's the end of the rant. But you get the, you kind of get the flavor there, which is let's move. We got to move. We got to do stuff. And we can't just be told that we can't. Our history is full of women in the 1840s who were told, you're not people. And slaves in the 1830s, you're not a person. You don't count. We have that history of social change in this country. But for some reason, we've become so goddamn obedient that we've forgotten how to even do anything. And so we write our letters. We go to hearings. They turn our microphones off when we get too loud, you know, and we're in that defensive thing that Frank talked about earlier. It's all about responding, but we have no narrative of our own. The rights of nature, that's a narrative. My God, it is not just the legal theory. It's a change in how we see everything. And that's why it's so dangerous and why it has to be done everywhere as soon as possible 
by as many people as possible. So anyway, that's my take. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. All right, then. You got a, a lot of praise from your, your rant there, Thomas. <laughs> so a lot of people are, are saying stuff in the chat, but it was stuff that needed to be said. So thank you. Um, are you guys okay with a couple more questions really quick? Yeah. All right. Um, two people both asked the same one, so I feel like it's important. Um, can you speak to the preemption issues some rights of nature ordinances are facing and strategies for advocates to get around them? Yeah, so I think the, the Florida case, and a lot of questions have been about the Florida case. One was, uh, if I remember correctly, what did it take to pass it in Florida? And amazingly, I mean, it was a lot of work. All these campaigns are a huge amount of work. We don't want to make them look easy. They're not. They're very difficult conversations to have. But in Florida, they spent about $30,000. $30,000 on a countywide campaign uh, for an initiative uh, that was drafted the right way and appealed to enough people. And that included, you know, when you get 89% of the vote, it's Trump voters, it's progressive voters across the board. You had some, you know, Trump windows who had, you know, passed initiative one uh, in the window because it really came down to clean water, came down to, you know, who's going to fight for the water. And it's certainly not the state that's doing anything. And so preemption is part of all this game that's played. Uh, preemption in Florida has been done over everything, including um, straws, you know, municipal communities wanting to get rid of plastic straws to municipal communities trying to pass ban on styrofoam, styrofoam to municipal communities putting limits on cruise ships coming in because they damage the natural environment with the just the sheer size coming into the small cruise places in Florida. You've had, uh, you know, any number of uh, plastic bag bans that have been overturned by state preemptive moves in Florida. And so I think the preemption concept is huge because it's anti-democratic. It's about, it's about a higher power further away from the community that's dealing with that particular issue who then steps in to say, that says you can't. You can't pass these kinds of laws. And eventually, I think, whether it's rights of nature law or the other work we do on community rights, where communities are, for example, banning or trying to ban synthetic herbicides and pesticides like glyphosate, is that a lot of state legislatures have stepped in and said, you can't ban glyphosate. We're going to prohibit you from banning glyphosate within your community. Even with this recent class action, you know, the Monsanto Bayer case that proved that glyphosate is cancer causing and the European Union has listed it and all those other things. So the, the fact is preemption is an anti-democratic thing that sometimes you got to crawl through to get these kinds of laws enforced. And the question is, how do you do that with a legal theory that, that passes muster? How do you win? And in Florida, part of the lawsuit was about that preemptive piece. It was not about just we pass rights of nature. This is how it needs to be enforced. It was questioning the authority, the constitutionality of the state legislature's preemptive law, questioning the ability of the legislature to pass it in the first place. That preemption, when it's used to squash laws passed at the local level, which establish higher standards than the state law does, that the state should not have the power to come in and actually kill it. That localities should have the power to pass higher environmental standards than are currently in place at the state level. And what's fascinating to me is that relationship already exists between the federal and the state in that, and this is really in the weeds, but long time ago, 40 years ago, the courts recognized that state constitutions can be more expansive than the federal constitution that state bills of rights can give more protections and more rights than the federal bill of rights does. What we're talking about is, is taking that relationship between the federal and the state and morphing it down to the state and local so that there's a relationship between the state and local, which is the same. That localities can pass higher standards, not lower standards, not taking it back down, but can move higher than state standards. So the state has a, has a standard of four uh, parts per million for mercury in water. And a community wants to pass something that is more stringent than that from an environmental protective standard, 
that they should be allowed to do so without having the state legislature able to preempt them. That to me sounds pretty reasonable. And in fact, there have been some courts in Ohio, a couple in California, along with the history back in the 1800s, where courts did recognize that localities have those kinds of powers. And so when we're talking about rights of nature, it's inevitable that the state legislatures who are mostly controlled by the largest industries on the planet will step in at behest of those corporations to try to stop you from better protecting nature in ways that will affect their bottom line. It's inevitable. And so just started to happen in a couple of places, probably going to happen in more places. But as the lawyers figuring this stuff out, we got to attack not just the bare enforcement stuff, but also go further than that to actually question the ability of states and the federal government in some ways to preempt us when we're trying to do a better job of protecting the natural environment or ecosystems at the local level. So I think that's how it's all tied together and that's how it has to be kind of attacked. Thank you. I, guess. I just wanted to quickly uh, jump in here. So my name is Victoria Gile. I am the um, conservation chair for the Great Waters Group. And I actually got an email this morning prompted by this presentation saying that there is a desire to try to get a rights of nature law passed at the Milwaukee County level. So if that's something that you're interested in, please email me. I just put my message or my email address in the chat for people who are here. Uh, ideally people who are in Milwaukee County, but other folks, if you're really interested, and especially if you have like legal background and things like that, please reach out. And kind of off of what Victoria said for one last question is people were wanting like suggestions from you both actually. So Tess, um, when you were giving your presentation, Thomas had mentioned like your 80 plus referendum and how amazing that was and was asking like what kind of public community campaign did it take to achieve that and if you had any resources um, to suggest and then Jeff also had mentioned the back 40 um, and was wondering if you both wanted to help fight that and also if you had any suggestions on who or how they could get that started. So I think people are just wondering like actions they wanna take if you have suggestions. Yeah, so in Florida, the uh, there's a bunch of resources that tell the story about what happened in Orange County. I would just Google Orange County rights of nature and it'll pull all that stuff up. And uh, that's the best way to do that. There were a couple of docu short documentaries, some films made, and now the constitutional amendment at the state level. The main group there is Florida Rights of Nature Network or FRON. So if you go to FRON.org, that's the best way to do it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Frank to talk about the rest and to have the last word without ranting. Huh. <laughs> huh. All right. Say that question again there since it's the last one. It was more if you had suggestions for how people can go about oh, doing similar work. I, I, you know, you have to get the dialogue going and you have to have people, I'll use the word diversity in a sense. And so simply because of what I was doing, and there's a lot of Indians that live in Minnesota, there's a lot that live in Wisconsin. You know, I was at an Indian law conference a couple of years ago and one of my friends, um, you know, told me he was thinking about doing rights of nature from their, from their band. Um, further south in Minnesota, and he was he was asking me about the rights of bees, and you know the rights of bees I thought was very intriguing because you can actually own them as property, um, and truck them around and transport them, and property can can be destroyed, and and you have a right to recover for property damage and losses, and so in a sense there's a different way to look at that concept because of what it means for air pollution, what it means for the plants, maybe even for water and other things. And so by having different people go one step past rights of nature, and I don't think we can do it to, well, how would I do that here? What is the thing that I have that might be that significant that might make that difference? Because you know, to try to just copy what happened next door doesn't work as well as understanding what your key might be that might be different. 
And that's why I think wild rice worked in a way because wild rice, you know, those of us in Minnesota and Wisconsin, we know what the words wild rice mean. And, and, and so we, we eat a lot of it, but wild rice doesn't mean much to the other 48 states, you know? And so sometimes you got to have something that's unique because the cooks talked about wild rice and things as well as the, the other people for, uh, for the judicial part of it. But, but you want to have something that's, that, people understand people relate to people enjoy people see in jeopardy and and so you know depending upon what that is i mean it could be flowering trees it could be bees it could be fish people have goldfish people have a bunch of fish in their home to watch you know it's hard to say what what people are connected to without having groups talk about those ideas so i would say you know there's a lot of opportunity Water is the key. It's just a question of how you're protecting it. And so I can't tell whether it's rights of water, rights of a river, rights of the Mississippi, rights of fish, rights of a I don't know what the right one is because to me, they're all doing the same thing. I'm doing it from my cultural vantage point that I think is most easily articulated to show its significance and importance to everyone else. Thank you. So not to take up too much of your time, I just wanted to say thank you both again. Um, I know there were a few questions that hadn't gotten answered yet. So if you don't mind me sending those along to you um, and thank you all for joining as well. So, Thomas or Frank, if you had anything else you wanted to say. Nope, I'm good. Nope, just thanks to everybody for carving out the time uh, tonight to, uh, to listen. Yep, we'll see you again. Yeah, thank you both. I know it's still slightly early for you guys. So have a wonderful evening and I'll send out the Zoom or YouTube recording next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. much.